Uh, thanks all for coming. Um, my name is Liam Herringshaw. I am a tutor in lifelong learning here at the University of York. And when I'm not doing that, I am a researcher in paleontology at Durham University. So I split my time, well, I spend most of the working week in Durham, but some of the time here in York. And as a, a, a paleontologist, um, at the moment, I spend a lot of my time working on Jurassic shales and the fossils preserved in them, including the, the Yorkshire coast, the Dorset coast, and, uh, and various other parts of the world. But my, I guess my background by PhD is into slightly older rocks, back into the, uh, into the Paleozoic. And I'm particularly interested in how marine ecosystems have changed through time. Um, so trying to understand how different organisms have, have, uh, have played different roles in the functioning of, of marine ecosystems over long periods of time. And I'm particularly interested in the way that animals interact with their environment in the marine realm, and particularly how animals interact with sediment. So burrowing creatures of various kinds. But that doesn't really link me very neatly into, into John Phillips, except for the fact that he had uh, a, a, strong, uh, a strong background in invertebrate paleontology. Um, my recent interests have become more on the history of, of geology as well, as to where our thinking comes from. Where, you know, the, who were the people who really made the great, uh, the great leaps of, of imagination and deduction that helped us get to the point that we are now in an in a earth science uh, with understanding the geological record, the, the, the history of life on earth, uh, and more recently things like tectonics, uh, and, and being able to put absolute ages to events that have happened in, in earth history. And this gentleman had a very important role to play in all of that. Uh, and living in York, um, I've become increasingly interested in someone, this gentleman here, who most people don't probably know an awful lot about. And yet, as a, as a scientist, um, he was one of the most important figures of his, of his time. And the Time Lord part really refers to the fact that he played a, a, a very important role in describing and understanding the geological record. And uh, so what I'm going to do tonight, I'm not going to be able to cover every aspect of his life, um, but I want to just really talk about who John Phillips was and his, his links to York, how he came to be here and, and what he did here, and then what his work has meant um, to, to earth science subsequently. It is also a little bit of a teaser for a course that I am proposing um, in the Centre for Lifelong Learning for the 2014-15 programme that will look at, at historical geology from various people, <coughs> particularly people you perhaps haven't heard of. There are various names, I guess, like Darwin and, uh, and Lyle, who are well known as, as people in, in the history of Earth science, but many others who've, who play very important roles who perhaps aren't so well known, and John Phillips, I think, is, is one of those. Now, I said, I, I just have a strange little link into this Last year, I'm from Leicester originally. I'm living in, in York and being from Leicester last year, particularly a lot of debate going on about um, where a certain old disreputable gentleman should be buried. Um, and I got into various discussions about that and hadn't realised at that point that this gentleman, who was at the other end of the spectrum in being extremely reputable, but perhaps little, uh, little well known outside of geological circles, is buried in York and wished to be. And so last spring, having written a piece about why I actually thought York didn't really need Richard III and Leicester did, um, as a historical perspective, I then ended up writing a piece, and, and the picture on the previous slide came from the York Mix website where I, I wrote these couple of articles. And the second one was about tracing a bit of, of John Phillips's. History. So this is the gravestone you will find in, uh, in York Cemetery, where a very unassuming tomb 
and you'll see, well, it's, it's an I rather than a J, I guess, in a sort of Latinized fashion. Uh, covered in lichen now, not really very distinct. But here, both John and his, his sister Anne are, are buried. And even though he did not, was not born in York and didn't die in York, he wished to be buried in York. York played an extremely important role in his, his life and indeed in, in his sister's life as well. So 1874, in fact, it's pretty much exactly 140 years ago, late April 1874, that John Phillips, uh, that John Phillips died. And again, people now don't really think of him perhaps as a, as a household name, but when he died uh, in Oxford, 150 university academics escorted his coffin to the station and then the train took him up to York and he laid in rest in the Yorkshire Museum um, where he'd spent many years working as I'll discuss and then he was uh, uh, the, uh, the cortege uh, went through the city and the, uh, the bells of the minster tolled for, for 90 minutes and it is said thousands of people came out to, in some fashion to pay their, their respect so although we may not know that much about him now in the, uh, in the 19th century, he was a very significant figure, not just in York, but, but particularly, uh, particularly so. So I want to talk a bit about where he came from, what he did, and, uh, and, and why we should remember him um, as a significant figure in, in scientific history. To go back to the beginning, he was born in a very small settlement, I think he's sitting on uh, cough sweets, which is a good sign. Um, he was born in a small village called Marden in Wiltshire on the edge of Salisbury Plain on Christmas Day 1800 and the reason I've put this particular so here's, here's the village the River Avon kind of cuts through the, the, the wooded section here is the, is the River Avon this annotation on the map refers to the fact that although again you probably haven't heard of it Marden Henge is actually one of the big Neolithic landmarks around Salisbury plain and is actually bigger than Stonehenge as a complex, but not that much of it is preserved now and uh, it's perhaps not that well known about. His, well, the surname Phillips gives you a hint. His family was of Welsh extraction, although he was born in Wiltshire. His father was an excise man and seems to have moved around quite a lot with his, his excise duties. Um, so the family actually didn't, well certainly in terms of from when Phillips was born, the family didn't stay in Marden for especially long because his sister Anne uh, was born in the Somerset village of Monkton Coombe, just south of Bath. And so the family seemed to have moved around the sort of Wiltshire, Somerset area um, quite a lot over those years and presumably his father's job played a, a key role in that, going wherever the excise duties required him to work. Now Monkton Coombe is best known in geological circles as being the, the village in Somerset where William Strata Smith lived. And he is probably best known as, as the man who produced the first geological map. And indeed next year is the bicentenary of Smith's geological map of England and Wales, which was the first time anybody had produced a large-scale map of where the rocks actually were across a, an area. And Tooking Mill House, which is where William Smith was, was living around the turn of the uh, 18th, 19th century, is, is within the hamlet of Monkton Coombe. And there's probably no coincidence that the, uh, the Phillips family moved to Monkton Coombe because, Monkton Coombe because Elizabeth John's mother was William Smith's sister. So this gentleman is rather better known in the history of science, and I'm arguing tonight that his nephew should also be recognised perhaps a little more than we, than we currently do. Now why was William Smith in Monkton Coombe? Well, he was a canal surveyor um, from fairly humble background, the son of a blacksmith in, in Oxfordshire, not from a, a well-to-do family, but clearly an able young man, became a canal surveyor and began to realise as he was employed 
uh, digging and, and, and surveying canals, initially the Somerset Coal Canal. Um, as you can see, the, the name gives it away that the, the movement of coal was a, was a very important um, issue in the early, the well, late 18th, early 19th century, getting firepower to the developing industrial centres around Britain was, was, a, was a logistical challenge. The roads were not great, so the big burst of canal building uh, tied into that. And Smith was employed for a number of years in surveying and, and, uh, and, and building, building out the route of the Somerset Coal Canal, Bath being up here and Monkton Coombe being um, not too far south from Bath. Now, the canal isn't there any longer. It's been filled in, um, I think, filled in the late 19th century. But what was particularly interesting from a geological perspective, as, as Smith was digging his way around um, Somerset, was that he began to realise that there was a systematic pattern to the way that the rocks appeared. And so he grew up in Oxfordshire, and he'd been interested in, in fossils in some sense from an, early, from an early age. So it seems that... I don't know how far back perhaps this goes, but certainly uh, John Phillips, with his uncle's interest, was going to be exposed to some degree of, of natural history and geological um, expertise. When Smith was actually on uh, in an inn not far from, uh, from Monkton Coombe, a village called Dunkerton, he realised, I mean, don't you, there's this great challenge in, in, in geology of how do you know how to link different layers in the strata? So in the layers of rocks that we have, how do you go from one region to another and know that you are in the same layers of, of geology? You could, you could argue that if you find the same rock types in different places, that that indicates you're in the same period of, of time. But actually what we now know is that different periods of time can have the same environments which will lead to the same types of rocks being deposited. So a sandstone tells you that you had an environment that had a lot of sand in it, and there are many different environments in which that can happen. And simply saying that if you find a sandstone in Bath and a sandstone in Yorkshire and they look quite similar in colour, they are therefore the same unit, is a very risky business. What Smith realised was, as he was digging his way through the canals of uh, southwest England, and uh, moving further afield in a few occasions, was that the fossils were the key thing. Because even though the rock types could be repeated, the fossils, as he saw them, did not get repeated. So you saw a succession. And I thought it was rather appropriate that he was, apparently in, in his notebook, in his, in his diary from 1796, he's in this old inn on the, on the canal, uh, where the canal meets the Foss Way. And being on the Foss Way, he realised that fossils were the way to dis distinguish the layers of, of rock rather than the actual rocks themselves. So in terms of the time, time banding of, of the strata, he argued, ah, fossils are going to be the key thing here. And I would predict, if I see a systematic pattern of different fossils appearing one above the other, that I can use that to go elsewhere. And even if the rocks are slightly different, the fossil pattern should be broadly the same. And that's actually what allowed him to start building out this map. This map came many years later. It took him many years to, to, to develop it. But he was able to start following bands around the country. And of course, as any of you know, walking around the UK, there isn't an awful lot of rock exposed in many places. It's, we're quite a lush country, a lot of vegetation covering it. So the way that William Smith's map appears indicates that there's rock, bare rock covering the surface. This is actually predictive, it's, it's scientific, it's saying, I can't see the rock here, but I can predict based on the layering that I see, the, the, the orientation that the beds are dipping in, and the fossils that I'm finding, that I can, I can build out this, this map. So his role in, in geological science was extremely important. Now, for John and his sister Anne, and indeed they had a, a younger brother, Jenkin, born in 1807, they had a pretty tricky childhood because in very quick succession, when John was uh, between the age of seven and eight, both his parents died. So they were suddenly orphaned. Now, Elizabeth's brothers, including William, all lived in, in the sort of Wiltshire, Somerset area. So they took on the responsibility of looking after the junior Phillipses. And so John and Anne and, and, and Jenkin were brought up um, by the Smiths, and particularly William took a, an interest in, 
in their education, and particularly in John's education. So, of course, it's tragic that John lost his parents so young, but in a, in a certain way, it actually m exposed him to what his uncle was thinking about and led him to become the geologist that, that he did uh, turn into. Now, Smith, when, uh, when John Phillips was about 10, sent him away to uh, a school back in, in Wiltshire, not far from where the Phillips has, had been living when, uh, when John was born. The village of Holt um, had, a, had a school there, a fee-paying school. Um, I guess at that time all schools would have been fee-paying, really. Um, and he was sent there for a number of years to get a, a basic education. And then he returned back to, um, back to Somerset, where he was then put in a very specific education for a year with the Reverend of Farley Hungerford. Benjamin Richardson, the, the, the Reverend of this, this parish, was a very interested amateur geologist and had been working with William Smith in various questions of the area's geology. So Phillips was then further exposed to a, um, to a geological way of thinking, not just from his uncle, but also from this, uh, this local reverend who, who took him under his, his wing. Now it's interesting, it, apparently Phillips was, was rather more devout than his uncle. Um, and it is suggested that this year, at a formative age when he spent the time with, with uh, Richardson, may have played a, a, a key role in that. But he was, he was a very liberal Anglican. As far as we can tell from his, his, his notes, he was, he was very sort of open to, to different ways of, of thinking. So at the age of, of 14, 15, he, he, had, uh, he basically finished his schooling and returned back under his, his uncle's uh, charge. And it was from, from, a, from this early age, he, he showed an extremely strong interest in, um, in what his uncle was doing. And his uncle records it, so William Smith records in his, his journal a number of occasions with the young John Phillips, the, the JP uh, being referred to. And this statement in November 1815 is quite, quite important because what they were doing, Smith had built up quite a, a fossil collection, but it seems that he was not the most rigorous of taxonomists. So in terms of classifying the fossils, naming them, identifying them. He was, he was good, but he didn't go into great detail. It seems that Phillips had a much greater interest in, in really classifying things in, in more detail and, and really making sure he knew exactly which species occurred where. And so spending these, these years, um, 1815 to 1819, um, back with his uncle and, uh, and, and cataloguing the collection and, and, and working with his uncle as he was building this map of, uh, of England and Wales, and indeed trying to publish the catalogue as well, um, to try and make a, a living. Because Smith was in an interesting position. He, didn't, he wasn't a man of means, so he had to try and sort of make a, a living. And obviously, Canal Surveyor made him, him money. Um, he got involved with a, a quarry business, trying to provide good quality building stones to, to, uh, to, to local uh, local merchants. This, he, he, he wasn't a great businessman, it, it, it seems, and part of that was probably his circumstances, that he was not a, a man of great standing and it was a challenge for him to be able to really get into the... The, the geology of the time was mostly ruled, the geological circles of the time were run by, by gentlemen who had time and money to be able to explore this kind of activity. And it was, I think, a little bit more difficult for someone like Smith from humble means, son of a blacksmith in Oxfordshire, to, uh, to, to take on that, that role. This gentleman is, well, depending on your preference for Latin or Swedish, Carl von Linné or Carolus Linnaeus, the man who coined the binomial classification of organisms that we still use today. So the fact every species has two Latin names, the generic uh, name and the specific name. So for us Homo sapiens, um, Homo being the genus and sapiens being the species, what uh, Smith and, and Phillips were doing was classifying all the fossils that they found using this 
um, using this system. So what, what that came out of it somewhat was that a lot of places had local names for fossils. And the challenge of actually correlating different regions was made more, more difficult by the fact that different regions had different names, different colloquial terms for the fossils. So if someone, you know, you couldn't just pop up the road and, and go and inspect things very easily. It took a lot of time to get around the country. And if someone wrote you a letter saying, oh, we found something that they might call a, uh, you know, a local name that you didn't know for sure whether it was the same thing you were looking at, it was quite a, a slow process to reconcile all these layers. So actually using Linnaeus' system, system and giving more Latin names was crucial. For Smith, and with increasing assistance from his nephew, uh, 1815, so I say next year will be the bicentenary, we saw him publish this uh, extraordinary, and they say particularly extraordinary because it really was the efforts of one person. It wasn't a team, edu a team effort, it was, it was William Smith with some assistance from Phillips and, and a few local correspondents, but really him going out and producing this, this map. Off the back of the map, which was produced in 1815, he then, between 1816 and 19, produced the accompanying book, Strata, identified by organised fossils. And this was the, the key thing, organised fossils. So you had to organise your collections, you had to also understand where the different fossils appeared in the strata. And this is where Phillips actually became um, much more skilled than his uncle had been. So all was looking rather, rather good. Um, I won't go into the great depths on, on the, what happened to Smith subsequently. Should you wish to explore more, if you haven't read this book already, The Map That Changed the World by Simon Winchester tells the, the, the story of William Smith's uh, decline, well, no, rise, decline, and, and then rise again, um, that he had become noted for this work, but struggled to get recompense for it. And at around... 1815, uh, 16, the burdens of various financial responsibilities, not least looking after his nephew, um, led him to go into uh, financial dire straits. And he did end up spending, Smith ended up spending uh, 11 weeks in a debtor's prison in London because eventually he couldn't pay the bills that he owed because his, his various seemingly productive business lines just weren't bringing in cash. His map was plagiarised, other people started trying to take credit for his work, and because he wasn't in a position of power, it was difficult for him to, um, to really make the money that he needed. So this is the King's Bench in Southwark, where he, he spent a number of weeks. Phillips was by that time in London with him, and Smith had been living in London for, for a couple of years with Phillips and, his, and, uh, and William Smith's wife. Um, but they had to sell all the collections, all the fossils they catalogued had to be sold. Basically, the government bought them, but at a knockdown price because Smith was so desperate for money. And uh, Phillips, we don't know exactly how often he visited his uncle in, in, in prison. We don't know quite what was, what was going on um, at that time precisely. But he saw his uncle suffer quite significant hardships um, in, this, in this period. And having thought that London would be the, 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 the place where they would have great success, it proved to be rather more difficult. So when Smith was released and found his house had been cleared out by the, the bailiffs, he, the, the house was locked, they, Phillips and Smith could not go back to the house, they had to come up with a new plan. And so they became, well, Smith, this, Phillips wrote a, a biography of his, his uncle in uh, 1844, and there are various quotes about what was going on at that, at that time, and Phillips describes Smith becoming a wanderer in the north. On release from the debtor's jail in 1819, they caught the stagecoach northwards and uh, reached North Allerton and decided that was as far as they needed to go and they would look for work. Now, Smith had built up quite a network of, network of contacts by that point, and one of the most useful, and certainly on the long term, very useful, was uh, uh, Sir, Sir, I can't his first name, but Sir Johnston, who occupied the um, Hackness Hall, just outside Scarborough, and he knew of Smith's ability um, as, a, as, a, as a quarry man, as a, as a recognizer of, of quality material, and Hackness had excellent stone, and so one of the jobs that, that Smith took on various roles, he, he was really a, an itinerant going around wherever he could find work, 
and Philip seems to have fallen in, in many, many places. But Johnston recognised that, that Smith was a man of talent and actually helped him get back on his feet and, and rebuild his, his career. And with Phillips in tow, who by now was actually a very astute geologist and paleontologist, he was now very good at, at identifying fossils and, and actually correcting his uncle's mistakes quite often. His uncle was a little bit more slapdash about certain ways that he, he marked boundaries. Phillips was a bit more careful and spotted things that his uncle had, had missed. They had a particular fondness for Scarborough, and indeed now you can, you can go to Scarborough in a William Smith trail. You can follow in the footsteps of William Smith around the town. And Phillips described Scarborough as this romantic and delightful town that, uh, that took uh, both of them under, under its wing. They, they still were moving around somewhat around the, the north of, of England. Smith was an amazing walker. Phillips seems to have, have been quite happy to follow. And then they, they covered an enormous amount of ground over those, over those years giving talks, going to different societies, presenting their, their findings, and building out, actually, then, a more, more detailed map of the geology of Yorkshire. For Phillips, in particular, his lucky break came when he and Smith came to York in 1824 to give a talk uh, in the city. And the recently established York Philosophical Society recognised that Phillips had a gift for lecturing and a gift for recognising and cataloguing fossils. And they had built up uh, a collection of fossils by this time which were in need of proper curation. This piece of uh, jawbone is from, you hopefully just about see the label, Kirkdale Cave. And that's uh, on the southern edge of the North York Moors near, uh, sort of between Pickering and uh, Kirkley Moorside. And during roadstone quarrying in, in, the, in the early 19th century, a treasure trove of, of vertebrate fossils were found, including this jawbone, which is in the, the Yorkshire Museum. And those were found by a chap called William Buckland, who was a professor at Oxford, who was an extraordinary character, and we'll uh, have to focus on him another time, because he's, he's, he's Phil Lecture and more. But the collections of the bones that they found in Kirkdale Cave were then taken under the, the stewardship of the Yorkshire Philosophical Society, and eventually the, the aim was to try and find somewhere to, to properly display these and have someone who could properly look after them and build the collections. So having given this talk in York in 1824 and, and shown his ability, Phillips was then asked if he would become the keeper of the, uh, the collections, so the, the curator of the, of the geological collections. So he moved to York. Uh, Smith carried on his itinerant mobile lifestyle, giving talks and visiting different sites around the, the country, eventually moving back down south again, being accepted back into society as a, as a great success, finally, thanks not least to the sponsorship of, of, of uh, his landlord at Hackness. What Phillips did really in the, in the, then in the 1820s was to start focusing a great deal more detail on the geology of, of Yorkshire. And so here is, uh, this is actually a later version of one of his, of his maps, but he's, he built out the different bands of rocks. We have the, uh, the Jurassic rocks, mainly exposed in the northern part of the, of the North York Moors and along the coastline, and then we have the, the chalk running down through here, and then there's a, a whole set of uh, of Ice Age deposits, and then inland we have uh, basically the, the, the Vale of York sitting on red sandstone, uh, a little wedge of magnesium limestone that runs up the basically onto the route the A1 follows, and then the the Dales out to the west, and then some some even older rocks up to the northwest of the county, and then the the coal measures down to the south, and what what you have, and it's always what Smith tried to do and Phillips followed that approach, was to map out where things are on the surface and then build up the strata, build up your, the, the stratigraphy, the, the writing of the layers, to show how those layers would be if you drilled down through vertically. Now they actually are tilted at a slight angle, so that this sort of vertical succession is, um, is slightly simplified. But that work on the geology of Yorkshire, and, and Phillips's detail of describing the fossils, the, the chalk fossils, 
from Flamborough, um, the many other Jurassic fossils from, from Scarborough and Whitby and, and along the coast, and then indeed uh, older fossils from, from the Dales. His meticulous detail got him a, a reputation as a, as a really excellent scientist. And so it's a, he, he'd improved and, and developed the maps that his, his uncle had, had begun. And this got him into the attention of bigger bigger fish, I suppose, if you're London and Oxford, I guess, being the two of the main centres. But Smith was still active, and indeed, the museum in Scarborough, the Rotunda, the, these wings were added a little bit later, but this central Rotunda party museum was, was built, effectively, by Smith, with Philip's assistance, to house all these specimens from the Yorkshire region. And the idea was to try and show them in their stratigraphic order. So you could walk round the room, and, there's a, there's a, and there still is a painting in the ceiling which shows the cliff section of the Yorkshire coast with the layers. And it's not absolutely sure, but it's thought Phillips actually produced that painting in the ceiling showing what the section of the coastline is. And then the fossils and the rocks were laid out within the room so you could walk your way around and through the strata and show and see what the diagnostic fossils were. So Phillips recognising and describing all these different fossils from different layers, you could then walk your way through them and say, ah, oh, okay, so if I find this particular kind of fossil sponge, I know I'm in this particular period of the, of the succession. If I find this particular mollusk, I'm in this particular part of the succession. And people could then come and look at that and use that as a reference and indeed, it was really the first purpose-built museum of that, of that kind. It was built from Hackness Stone, unsurprisingly, given that Smith was the foreman of the quarry. And I have a, a shameless plug halfway through, is that we are using the Rotunda Museum this September for the first Yorkshire Fossil Festival. So from Friday the 12th to Sunday the 14th of September, we will be running a whole series of free events um, on all sorts of aspects of the paleontology and geology and science of the north of England and using the rotunda as the focal point. So if you are keen to come and see some of Phillips and Smith's original work, plus a whole load of new stuff going on, we have all universities, York, Leeds, Sheffield, Durham, Hull, Natural History Museum, the Geological Society, the Geologist Association, many, many other organisations and all coming to, to show off their ongoing research. So if that sort of thing tickles your fancy, <coughs> come to the Rotunda Museum. The following year, realising that there was a need for the Yorkshire Philosophical Society's collections to actually be housed somewhere rather grander and, and, and more befitting the, the increasing size and quality of the, of the collections, the Yorkshire Museum was built in uh, what are now museum gardens. It too is built from Hackness stone. In fact, it's Geologically rather interesting because you walk around York and most of the old buildings are built of magnesium limestone. So the walls and the minster and all that, that's the, the Permian fossil free, pretty much, limestone. You won't find any fossils in it. But this Jurassic sandstone from which uh, both the Rotunda and uh, the York Museum are built does have fossils in it. And I can happily spend a few minutes every time I go by looking for burrows because the sandstones in those walls are full of tubular burrows, so when you get your eye in, you can actually see Jurassic sea life if you so choose. Now, one of my favourite stories relating to this, and this period is the, uh, the fact that... Well, so, so I, I was looking, I was trying to find the census records and seeing where Phillips was living, and um, St Mary's Lodge was the keeper's residence. So... For, I'm not sure for the whole time, but certainly for a significant time that he was in York. He and Anne, his sister, who had, who had come with him, uh, lived in the lodge on the edge of, of Museum Gardens. 1831 is a particularly interesting year because uh, one of York's other leading scientific figures, and indeed one of the Philosophical Society's other leading figures, one of the founders of the, of the Society, William Vernon Harcourt, helped with Phillips found the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And that organisation is still going. Um, 
It's now generally known as the British Science Association, and the British Science Festival takes place every year in September, and in fact is in Birmingham the week before the Yorkshire Fossil Festival, and we will have a presence there as well. So, he was, so Harcourt was a, a, a like-minded soul to, to Phillips of similar lines of, of thinking, both scientifically and, and religiously, both liberal Anglicans. He was, Harcourt was the son of the Archbishop of York. Um, so quite a, an important figure. But they did find themselves in some rather interesting situations because, of course, as Phillips and other geologists began to tease out this story of, of the fossils and the strata and realise that actually you had to have significant amounts of time to produce the layers of rock that we saw just within Yorkshire, let alone the country as a whole, that Phillips and Harcourt and, and many other figures started looking at, the, at this challenge of the age of the earth because, of course, there, was the, there were many literal, scriptural uh, churchmen who were sure of the Bible's dates for the age of the earth as being around 6,000 years old. Archbishop Usher of Armagh in the 17th century had, had calculated who begat whom through the, through the record and calculated the earth was created on the, now was it the 23rd or 27th of October, 4004 BC. It was definitely a Sunday, it had to be. Um, Phillips and co. realised that when you looked at the strata, this simply wasn't possible. And so they got into a lot of quite significant arguments with the figures, and in York particularly, interestingly, because Harcourt, the son of the Archbishop, was saying that figure of the 6,000 year age of the earth is, is clearly not true. But the dean of the Minster was preaching literal, biblical, scriptural 6,000 year age of the earth. So in York, you had the Yorkshire Philosophical Society slash British Association group, of which Phillips Harcourt and, and a few others were, were very strongly involved, saying, you know what, the geology is telling us that we have to have a large amount of time to accumulate all these rocks and, and fossils whilst from the pulpit in York Minster the Dean was saying the complete opposite and, and demanding them to come up with an absolute age because the Bible of course from his perspective had a, uh, an answer, had a 6,000 year figure what was their figure? And they couldn't figure out a way to calculate it, it's very difficult I mean, if you said to you, how would you go and look at the rocks and work out how old they are? Now we have various techniques that we can apply that these guys had no idea about on things like radiometric dating, how rapidly elements decay and we can use the decay rates to calculate how long it is since something formed. But of course, at that time, no one had any idea either about radioactivity, let alone the idea that you could, you could calculate decay rates. So Phillips particularly was quite reticent to give an age. He would say it was old, but he wouldn't say exactly how old. But these arguments went on for, for, for many years. Um, and eventually, I think Phillips and Harcourt and Co. decided the best thing was almost just to ignore Coburn and let him, let him rant and just not really get too heavily involved with it because they couldn't really quieten him down. <coughs> My, this, this was a photograph pointed out to me by Pat Hadley who for a, a short while was working uh, as a Wikimedian in residence in the uh, Yorkshire Philosophical Society and, and, and Yorkshire Museum because this bear, sadly it isn't the bear in question, but when the, when the museum was opened it wasn't just a museum, it was also zoological gardens and there were a number of live animals, one of which was a bear. And there's a fantastic quote that I have to read. Um, Anne-Marie Akehurst wrote an article about the history of the Yorkshire Philosophical Society, and it's up on the York University website. Um, and this bear was a bit of a problem. Uh, the quote that I, that I have, the bear escaped from its cage and chased Phillips and Harcourt into an outbuilding, and as a consequence was not to be forgiven for this, and 1831 was offered to London Zoo, and the secretary there wrote with regard to its transportation to the capital a rather hilarious letter, particularly if he didn't know it was a bear being discussed. Uh, Zoological Society of London, December 26th, 1831. Sirs, we shall feel much pleased in taking your bear on the term proposed in your letter of the 21st. The best mode I can conceive of forwarding to us is by one of the York coaches, you booking him on as an outside passenger and promising the guard a recompense on his delivering him safe in London. Be so good as to send us a line to inform us of the coach by which the animal is to travel and the place and probable time of his arrival in town. So the National Express going down from York to London has a bear sitting in it, having to be kept an eye out, and, and they'll tell you what time it'll arrive in London, and you can go and meet it. I just think that's a, uh, 
a fantastic idea. I wanted to stick a bear on a bus and send it down to London. But apparently that's what happened. And, and the bear was then taken to London Zoo, which, which was better equipped to look after, uh, look after a bear. So the stuffed bear in the York Museum is not apparently the one in question, sadly. Phillips, though, did uh, shortly afterwards get offered work in London. And although he retained his, his link in York, and indeed his house in York, he, he didn't go and, uh, go and live in London. He, he, 1831, he headed down to London, where he found the scene was rather different to what it was in, in York, and is quoted as saying that the, the jealousy among the men of science here is wonderful. He found it a very, a very much more antagonistic world. I think York had been a rather, or allowing for the Coburn disagreements, it was a rather, uh, rather more tricky place to be, to be based. In 1834, to show that he really was being appreciated as a, as a man of, of scientific quality, he was appointed professor at King's College London, but he still lived in, in York. Um, I'm not sure whether he was uh, going up and down on stagecoach with, with the bears. However, London didn't, didn't completely suit him, and in 1840, he was... Well, he began to do a lot more field work um, in other parts of the country, but still with a lot of interest in, in Yorkshire. 1840, he becomes more involved with the, Yorkshire, uh, with the Geological Survey, um, which was trying to map Britain in much more detail right across the, the country. I should just say, 1836, with, with the Tour de France, your, your Dale cycles... Uh, if you go and look in the, the rocks in the Yorkshire Dales and indeed Northumberland coast and many of the parts of northern Britain, you find there's a systematic repetition of the rock types. You get a limestone, a mudstone, a sandstone and a coal. And this is repeated over and over again. Phillips is the man who recognised that there was this repetition of succession. And taking the old name for Wensleydale, Yordale, these became known as Yordale cycles. And you can still, they're still a, a key thing for, for going and studying environmental change on different scales. We see these packages change at different levels. And indeed, I was out on the coast of Northumberland yesterday logging through one of these because we're quite interested to see the climate change signals that the changes in rock types tell us. Because the different rocks tell us about different environments. And so understanding how those rocks change through a succession can tell us something about how the climate and the environment is changing over different time scales. Now, Phillips, I don't think, had uh, any sense at that time of... of of long-term climatic changes necessarily, but he recognised that there was cyclicity, uh, there was cyclicity in these successions. So most geologists you meet now will, if you mention Yordale cycles, they will have had them drilled into them at some point in their geological education, and it's Phillips who was the first person to, to really recognise those. So if you're out the Tour de France and the Dales, you can, you can say, oh, there's cycles way out here before, before the... Uh, the 1840s, so, so Phillips is still very much linked into York in, in terms of living here or having a house here some of the time of the year. But in the early 1840s, he became a paleontologist for the Geological Survey, and they wanted people to go out into Wales particularly and, and look at the fossils there and try and build out a more detailed picture of the, of the geology, because when they'd first been examined in the 1830s, there weren't many fossils in a lot of places. They realised they needed more detailed work. This is a trilobite, uh, an early form of, of arthropod, distant relatives of, of uh, crabs and lobsters. This is a picture that Phillips himself drew in 1841 uh, in the rather wonderfully named Golden Grove in Pembrokeshire. Um, and the fossil beds in, in that part of the world yield many beautiful trilobite specimens. So um, Phillips was able to start using the different species there to start building up a, a stratigraphy. In 1844, he was offered a position in Dublin, so he went out to become a professor at Trinity College, and the intention at that point was the Geological Survey of Britain and Ireland would allow him to go off and carry on his work that he'd been doing in Wales and, and, uh, and the north of, of England and take it out into, into Ireland. But for reasons that I'm not fully sure about, that didn't quite work out. And so he did spend a few years in Dublin, but didn't, uh, didn't end up staying there in quite the way he anticipated. But the early 1840s are particularly important for the fact that he had now studied enough geology and, enough, and, and collected enough fossil data to make a very bold statement, which is actually one that has underpinned geology ever since. And you may not have realised this, but this 1840-41, around the time he was sort of wrapping up his first main stint in, in York and then heading out to Pastures New... He built up this, this chart showing different groups. You can't really see, but Z is zoophytes, 
um, sort of coral-like groups, crustacea, uh, brachiopods. Very, and this is, these are basically chunks of time. So imagine the strata, the, the geological layers, and he's, Phillips has, has identified the appearance of the different groups in each of the different layers. And what he recognised from this fossil data was that there were two big turnovers, as we would now call them. I mean, we also call them extinction events now. But he realised, going through the fossil record, that a whole load of things disappeared at two stages. So there was a general trend of increasing diversity. There were two big blips. And as a consequence of that, he coined the, the structure that we still follow today of three main eras of life, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and at that point, Cainozoic, now tends to be called Cenozoic. Old life, middle life, and new life. Sometimes referred to the age of fishes, the age of reptiles, and the age of mammals, although that's not quite as, as good a description, really, as old, middle, and, and new life, because the main groups uh, actually cross the boundaries, we now know. However, he point well, people have used Paleozoic in a rather informal sense in the past, but he was the first person to formally do, coin them, and Mesozoic was his term. So we can actually lay claim, lay claim to the era of the dinosaurs in York in a fashion. That's what it looks like now. Periods within those, those units. Um, many of those names had already existed, but what then starts happening is people realise you could subdivide the units more, uh, more precisely. And divide it on record in that way is, is thanks in no small way to Phillips's work. 1851 census, I finally found a copy of this. This is uh, a bit hard to read, it keeps cropping in different ways. But there's Mary Gates at Mary's Lodge, John and Anne Phillips, uh, head of the household and sister. He's 50, she's uh, 48, and it's described in quite long details. FRS, Fellow of the Royal Society, former professor of King's College London, and many other things. If you're familiar with census form in such detail, I think, his, I think Anne is just described as an annuitant. He's relying on annuities, I, I guess. But they were back in St Mary's Lodge. So after the Irish uh, phase, they came back to York for, for, um, for a few more years and were back in the museum, uh, museum gardens. But in 1853, he was offered a position in Oxford. Um, and 1856, promoted to reader, sadly after the death in a train crash of one of his close friends, Hugh Edwin Strickland, who was a Yorkshire geologist who, uh, who Phillips had worked very closely with, but was uh, sadly killed near Retford. After, after, just after having met with Philip to do some work on the coast, Philip went back to York and uh, Strickland went back south again, stopped to look at some rocks in the railway cutting and was, uh, was sadly hit by a train. Philip then became, having been obviously so, such a successful uh, keeper of the collections in York, then became the keeper of the museums in Oxford, including the Ashmolean, and eventually, rather appropriately, I suppose, having first begun with William Buckland's Kirkdale Cave specimens in the Yorkshire collections, when Buckland died. Phillips was appointed to the professorship at Oxford, so he'd come from this orphaned son of an excise man from Wiltshire to become professor of geology at Oxford, and a, a fairly impressive trajectory. And his, his biographer, Jack Morell, described him as having a Dick Whittington-like character, that's certainly a fair rags-to-riches type uh, trajectory. But just to finish, go back to the age of the Earth. As I said, when he was in York, he hadn't put an age on the Earth. He was reluctant to, to do it. When Darwin, in 1859, published his groundbreaking book, The Origin of Species, he included various lines about how old he, he needed lots of time to explain natural selection. And Darwin wasn't perhaps careful enough, and he argued that the age of the rocks in the Weald in southeast England was probably about 300 million years old. Phillips was absolutely certain that wasn't true. And then started looking into, well, how long did he think it took to, for sediments to accumulate? And he began to try and think, how long would it take for layers of sand and mud to lay down and build up? And eventually, after spending some years thinking about this, he proposed that the sedimentary rock succession seen on Earth, which was kilometres thick, miles thick, if you went through the whole succession, would have taken, in his estimation, between 38 and 96 million years to deposit. So finally Coburn got a, an answer, although he was dead by then, I think. Um, so, so he was putting a figure of tens of millions of years for the age of the Earth, and saying that Darwin was way out. We now know Darwin was way out for the age of the wheel, but actually Smith, uh, sorry, Smith and Phillips's work that laid the foundations gave you a point to start trying to calculate it, but we, we now know that the Earth 
is a good deal older than, than, than Phillips came up with. I should also quickly mention he was interested in astronomy and in the 1860s was actually spending quite a lot of time with the local astron astronomical society. I think an interest he developed in York when he was in Oxford and was describing features on the moon and on Mars and indeed now there are craters on the moon and Mars named after Phillips as in recognition of things that he first observed and described. And I think it would be rather interesting, of course we now know there are strata on Mars. There are sedimentary rocks, layers of sandstone, we now know from these extraordinary new images that NASA are producing. So in a fashion you could start applying some of the thinking, although we have no evidence there are any fossils on Mars yet. But perhaps if there are microbes preserved you could start to apply in some very dif difficult and distant way a Martian stratigraphy. So I think Phillips would be probably quite amused to learn that the things they developed on Earth could and that's the theory of stratigraphy. It should work elsewhere. You should find the same sort of things. So if we ever do find any signs of simple life in the rocks and Mars, you could use the same kind of approach that Phillips used on, on Earth. 1862, his sister died, and she'd lived, she'd lived with him for 33 years, I think. 1829 to 1862, but the year she died, she'd been his housekeeper. Neither of them ever married, and they, they, they lived together, looked after each other. Um, and clearly... He depended very greatly on her, although we don't know an awful lot about her. Um, there are letters between the two from which uh, this, this quote that he wrote to her, um, through many years your counsel has been my guide and your gentle and true affection my reward, and though at times my rough nature must have hurt your feelings, you know I love you and I'm capable in your cause of bearing and doing much which for none other I would bear to do. So they clearly had a very close relationship, even though it's often hard to get an exact sense of, of what their personalities were like. Um, just to sort of wrap up with he was covered in garlands of various kinds his work was recognised by every, pretty much every geological and scientific institution it could be he had honorary doctorates from many different institutions he, had the, he was awarded say, at the age of 34 fellow of the Royal Society in 1845 the Wollaston Medal the highest medal of the Geological Society of, of London he then became president of the Geological Society of London became president of the British Association of the Advancement of Science and named countless fossil species. I have, perhaps appropriately, a Natural History Museum guides to the Mesozoic fossils of Britain and the Paleozoic fossils of Britain. And almost any page you open it, you will see a fossil name on there with Phillips, named after the Latin. And that's because he named that particular fossil. So you can find an extraordinary legacy of the things he described, even to this day. If you go out fossil hunting on the Yorkshire coast, you will quite quickly find something that Phillips named. If you wish to explore more of his life, uh, Jack Morrell's book, John Phillips and the Business of Victorian Science, is, a, is an excellent summary of the, the situation at the time in the mid 19th century. And of course, Simon Winchester's book about William Smith does also feature quite a lot about Phillips and, uh, and, uh, and the, the world they were living in and, and, and what the challenges they faced. And as I say, <coughs> should you be more interested in other figures of geological science over the 19th and 20th century, uh, later this year, hopefully. I shall be able to run the Heroes of Rock course, and I will reveal... Some of these you might know, some of these you might not. I'm not going to tell you who they are. You can come on and find out. Thank you very much. Thank you.